Welcome to the Books Cafe, your literature program on KBC English Service. I'm your host, Hainga Okwemba. The Books Cafe is a cutting-edge program in the world of literature where we talk uh, to writers and explore uh, contemporary uh, literary issues. And today we have a very, very uh, special program. A very special program. Imagine the host, Hainga, actually sitting uh, sandwiched between uh, two very famous African writers and scholars of literature, Professor Taban Lo Leong from yeah. South Sudan. Prof, welcome to the program. Thank you. And Professor uh, Chris Wangela, the Kenyan professor of literature. Prof, welcome again on the Books Cafe. Asante sana. Now, you know, every time a writer or a scholar comes on this program, we start by, you know, just getting to... Uh, to know them a little bit so that we can actually contextualize uh, the discussion. So let's begin with Professor Taban Lo Leong. When and where were you born? I was born in Kajukeji, which is in South Sudan, just 20 miles north of the border between northern Uganda and South Sudan. Mm -hmm. And I was officially born, according to estimate, Mm -hmm. estimation on the 1st of January 1939 mm -hmm. but my parents tell me that I was born in 1936 in second term which would have been May which makes me 80 years young this year 80 years young this year yeah. <laughs> Many people who actually, because a prof is quite a name, and many people actually uh, used to confuse Professor Tabando Leong as being Ugandan. If you could just clarify that, how did that confusion come about? We can't say there is a confusion mm. because there are Africans who belong to areas which have become separated, and one part is in Uganda and one part in Kenya. Mm -hmm. or, uh, one part in Uganda and one part in Kenya. One part in Uganda and one part in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, during the colonial days, you can go from here, now a Kenyan, mm -hmm. you can go ahead and do some things in colonial Uganda mm -hmm. and uh, amongst your people and there's no problem. Mm -hmm. So the same with the South Sudanese now and northern Uganda or south northeast Kenyans and uh, Southeast South Sudanese and so on. So I was born in what became colonial South Sudan, Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, my people extend on both sides mm -hmm. of the border. Uh, but then uh, when we moved from s what is now South Sudan mm -hmm. to Gulu in Uganda, we then became identified as Ugandans. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I bestride both sides of the two countries. I am both a Ugandan and I'm both a South Sudanese, but the colonial boundary mm -hmm. makes my area now to be South Sudan. South Sudan. Now, when you talk actually of m moving to Gunu in Uganda, was it because of political upheavals or it was just during those migrations? No, it, it was during one, one of those uh, migrations. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was very, very progressive and an auntie of his was very jealous of that and uh, they wanted to have me killed. Mm -hmm. So my parents had to run away with me mm -hmm. to Uganda. Uganda. Oh, yeah. uh, so my family came to Uganda mm -hmm. for my safety. And then when I was in Uganda, the chief in whose court mm -hmm. we stayed, mm -hmm. uh, he sent me to school in 1945. Mm -hmm. He went and put me on his lap and interviewed me and found that I was good enough staff for school on Friday. And then he told my father, on Monday, send this kid to school in 1945, mm -hmm. second term. So I then went to school and I've remained in school as a student and as a lecturer since then, 70 good years. So you mean you actually, when you left South Sudan, the, your parents actually taking that step so that they could save you. You went and stayed with the chief. No, yeah. Uh, they took me to South Sudan in safety mm -hmm. because my own uncle, my mother's son, uh, my mother's brother, mm -hmm. was working in that chief's home. Uh -huh. And then when he came and heard that a uh, certain woman came with a cassava to poison me, mm -hmm. he said, uh, brother-in-law, since they wanted to kill my nephew, when this woman had no real cause for killing, mm -hmm. now that she took that cassava back and her own son, my age mate, mm -hmm. baby, oh, my age mate, yes. ate it and died 
he said, you had better run away with my nephew mm -hmm. to Uganda. Otherwise, she now has a reason why your son, my nephew, should live. You know, I was actually going back to that because it reads like that, the biblical story. Was it the story of Moses? There's also another story <laughs> of a more famous person. <laughs> yes, we'll come to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we'll come to that. Professor Chris Wangela, the, the famous a Kenyan professor of literature. Apparently, I don't think if there's anybody who is going to challenge me and refute my claim that he's actually your most famous a student, Professor Chris Wangela. <laughs> I have no quarrel with that. <laughs> <laughs> when I met you, the two African scholars, mine was actually just to provide a platform so that you can just reminisce. You are quite right to say Professor Tabano Leong has been my teacher for all this time. Uh, it's more than 40 years now. Because I remember when I arrived from the village, it was September 1968, and there used to be a writer's workshop on uh, what is now called K Street, and uh, I was anxious to see uh, writers because I had just uh, read writers. I had never met writers in person. So when I went to Paya Pa Art Gallery, which used to be on uh, K Street, as we call it now, mm. lo and behold, I met this Ugandan <laughs> professor called uh, Taban Loliong. Mm -hmm. He was wearing a jamba coat, you know. Days. We only used to see them, we, <laughs> we, we, you know, when tourists arrive here, they used to go and buy them at the, the Stanley Hotel. Yes. So I saw him, but his jumper god was full of books, and uh, he was uh, moving around uh, in a very flamboyant manner. <laughs> and then later, I realized that his uh, jumper god was ca carrying his uh, first book, of criticism called the last word. What I didn't like about him was uh, his uh, dismissive uh, attitude <laughs> to writers, you know, because he was telling uh, young writers, because I remember <coughs> we were sitting in uh, that workshop with uh, Everett Stander. <coughs> mm. Stander was reading a, a, no, a poem on uh, being a village or something like that, a poem that was very imitative of Joseph Brugger and Okot Babite. Mm. Then he was saying, when are you young writers going to be original? Why do you go on uh, imitating, you know, other writers? So I felt uh, picued, you know, because Standard was my senior at uh, French School I'm Singer. And here was this uh, a critic, uh, more, you know, lambastering, <laughs> I don't know how to call it. <laughs> yeah, so I felt very concerned that uh, I developed an antipathy for Taban mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. But later... We became friends because he's the one who took me to publishers. And he kept telling me how to operate as a literary critic. As a literary critic. Yes. You're right. You know, uh, <laughs> listeners, if you are just tuning in, uh, this is the Books Cafe on KBC English Service. Mm. And with me in the studio is the famous professor of literature and poet, Taban Lo Leong from South Sudan. And the famous Kenyan professor of literature, Professor Chris Wangela. Of course, I've actually avoided asking Professor Chris Wangela when he was born, because he's been on this program and we know that he was born sometimes in 1944. Yes, on the 4th of April, 1944. <laughs> you are right. And uh, I've grown uh, at uh, this studio, uh, especially in the 70s up to now. I've mm -hmm. always appeared here. You are right. Professor Chris Wangela says that uh, at first he had that yeah. antipathy towards yeah. you because you dismissed one of his senior students yes. at high school. Mm -hmm. And then he says that, uh, you know, that dismissive attitude. Yeah. Do you still consider yourself that you have that dismissive I attitude? I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. When uh, we were growing up uh, we, the first generation of African writers, we were evaluating and re-evaluating everything including what we were doing and what our people were doing and uh, so each one of us thought of himself as a judge of what goes on in our world especially about our own people and we said don't be so diplomatic as to let your brother continue doing the wrong thing uh, because culture, African culture would like you uh, to be diplomatic and not to say this and that and so on and so forth. So some of us said, don't only criticize the white world, the European world, criticize your own also. Because when you're criticizing your own also, then they'll grow up changing from what you have pointed out or at least re-evaluating it. Mm -hmm. So 
I made sure that coming from the University of Iowa, coming from America, I had that bravado, the American <laughs> bravado of uh, saying that I am there to challenge the whole world, to challenge everybody. And push my case forward <laughs> and let people go to examine whether what I'm saying is right or wrong, but not to say I let us not talk about ourselves when we are not doing that. Yeah. Because when God sent me a copy uh, of uh, the Song of Laweno, I read it at a sitting, I made notes about it, and that note is called Laweno is an edu, because in our time, an edu girl means she is uneducated. She's a village girl. So I said, I wrote it just like that, sent it to the publishers and everybody got very, very angry for uh, dismissing this literary icon of uh, East Africa and Africa. But seriously speaking, there are things to do with the uh, the world of uh, counting the years. Right. How does Lawino know that uh, the year of Jesus Christ born uh, started the first uh, year of the Christian uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. and then backwards go like that? Yeah. So I said, no, some of these things are caught thinking, not what Lawino can think. So, of course, you'd only have limited mm -hmm. Laweno to talking about the things in African culture which mm -hmm. she understands and uh, not answering questions in anthropology which, of course, knew. Because, of course, was now answering, was as debating anthropological matters with the, with the Laweno. Mm -hmm. So, I did that. It has not stopped us being friends with the court yes. and working together with the court right. uh, till uh, he died. Right. And this year, in... September or, or October, mm -hmm. his children and grandchildren are going to have a ceremony in Gulu for remembering uh, Okot. I'll actually come back uh, to that Okot Pabitek, the late you know, professor of literature, but also best known as a poet, uh, uh, one of those uh, very celebrated East African poets uh, with his book, A Song of Lawino. You know, we'll come to that. Yeah, okay. But uh, Prof, you are interested in literature. You once told me in one of those occasions when you hosted me at the university, when, uh, you once told me that you are interested in in literature before you came to the university was that you had a teacher, one of those European teachers who used to encourage. I don't know, you'd read the textbook and then a novel or a short story and then return it and then give it back to... What was it like? You know, your days... Uh, actually, we... Yes. I, I went to a school called Bungoma Second School. Bungoma is uh, very near Kampala. In fact, uh, when you are in uh, Bungoma, when in my time when people were looking for jobs they didn't come to nairobi no. they used to go to kampala and uh, bungoma was mainly a school run by scientists but then we had uh, this uh, american peace corps teacher called james victor warford he started this uh, notorious uh, habit of uh, creating a, a kind of blank page in the library and he let the students go to the library and uh, list the books that they have read so that at the end of the day, the student who read the longest, <laughs> you know, who had the longest list of books read mm -hmm. was uh, rewarded. And uh, I, I was very fascinated by that. Uh, at that time, we had uh, a series called Longman's uh, Simplified Series, where even Shakespeare was uh, summarized for ordinary read readers, like Lamb's Tales of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. you know, Around the World in Eight Days by John Buchan. You know, Charles Dickens, George Eliot, all those books were available in the Longman's uh, Simplified series. So I was encouraged by that American Peace Corps teacher to compete. And uh, I was ahead of my contemporaries uh, by actually reading uh, those books. But then came the time to, to be interested in uh, the harder aspects of literature. When the same American Peace Corps introduced me to Things Fall Apart, by Chino Achebe. And then it was Horace Awori, who was uh, after Namali High School. He was teaching us literature and he introduced us to Shakespeare's Macbeth. So slowly, that's how I got to be interested in literature mm -hmm. as a reader. Mm -hmm. But even then, the intermediate school at that time had libraries. Mm -hmm. So 
I was also a, a bookworm, so to speak. But to become a critic, when I came to the University of Nairobi, Taban Leong asked me to talk about Isaac Mpakalele as a literary critic. I had never thought of becoming a literary critic. But the moment he asked me to present a, a class paper on uh, Mpakalele, that is the time I now began to see myself uh, differently. I began to see myself as a, a literary critic. Mm -hmm. Then later, as we became uh, colleagues in the Department of Literature, we were giving public lectures. And he always told me, Chris, give it to them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in other words, be as, <laughs> you know. <laughs> be tough and attack. <laughs> give it to them. <laughs> be like uh, Gideon Were. Just, uh, if they ask you a, a useless question, just turn around and say, another question, and so on. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how he, he mm. trained me. <laughs> <laughs> but Prof, there's another aspect of, of course, uh, you actually mentioned, that's a very interesting revelation there that you make, that uh, Professor Tabando Leong actually, in those very nascent days, in your early days at the university, asking you to actually do some critical writing on the writings of the late uh, South African writer Ezekiel Mpakadele. But of course, you also, you are two English uh, 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 professors, Andrew Gar and what was the name of the other one, who actually asked you to do a study of Joseph Buruga's uh, uh, abandoned it heart? Was, uh, it was Edwin Roscoe. Yes. Who interested me in, uh, he was really helping with uh, that journal called Busara. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, first of all, Nexus. Then, uh, uh, a number of poems were published by East African Publishing House at that time. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, uh, Mbiti's uh, Poems of Nature and Faith, jo Joseph Brugger's The Abandoned, Abandoned Heart, mm -hmm. and uh, John Monogne's uh, novel called The Only Son. He challenged me to, to critique those uh, uh, poems. But what surprised me is that uh, Outside the class, he invited uh, uh, other poets like uh, Aminika Sam, uh, Jared Angira, and uh, a few members of staff for me to present my critique on uh, Mbiti and uh, Joseph Brugger. This was outside the class. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what he was up to, mm -hmm. but uh, in a way, my, I first saw myself in print after writing a critique of uh, Brugger and, uh, and Mbiti. Very important there to actually just understand how it all began. He became the famous uh, Kenyan uh, literary uh, critic. Mm. Professor mm. Tabando Leong, mm. about mm. your own education. Yeah. Yes. So how was your uh, going to school, um, the things that actually prepared you to be the famous uh, poet and professor of literature that we know? First, is that uh, when we came, to Gulu, to a place called Bobby, mm -hmm. which was in Acholi land, we were foreigners who spoke a different language. My language is Kuku, which is part of the Bari language, which is akin to Maasai, Erate, so uh, Karmajong, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So at home, we spoke Kuku. In school, we spoke Acholi. On my first year in the school, every Friday afternoon, it was a period for telling folk tales and i was there with a very poor knowledge of actually language and uh, you either tell a story because they used to go in round in a turn the first boy in front go to t goes to tell a story if you fail to tell a story you are made to sit down in front of the class in shame so I had to rescue myself with the little actually that I knew to go and tell a f small story uh, about uh, the uh, hare and the elephant and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Two or three minutes was enough. So there were boys, actually boys, who knew how to tell tales much more than I did because they're using uh, actually, which is their own language. But from that time onwards, I had now to learn how to, uh, to speak more fluent actually and also to tell stories. And then uh, when I went to Good High School, uh, I read a Christian magazine called African Challenge, which was uh, published in Jos in Nigeria. And uh, some white man who had been a veteran in the Second World War, where my brother also had been, had written a Christian pamphlet about the war. So I read about it, I asked for him to send me a copy, I got the copy and translated it into Acholi and took it to 
reverend then Janan Luwum, who later on became the Archbishop of Uganda, to correct my Acholi and to make it more beautiful. He did. So that was the first publication which was published by me in secondary school, in Guru High School, uh, sometimes in uh, 1952. Yeah. Uh, but then I went to Gulai School, uh, where Okot had been. My father-in-law, my first father-in-law, Lachet Okech, also had written a book, a history book. And another actually who had been to my career, called Anywa, also had written a book. So as far as we were concerned from Gulai School, we considered ourselves the best. Because King's College Budo in Kampala was for the sons of chiefs in Buganda, Gulu High School was also for the sons of chiefs in Acholi area. At the beginning, it was for the whole of the, the northern province. Yeah, so right. we considered ourselves, ourselves top, and we didn't care whether you are in Uganda from King's College Budo or whatever, wherever you came from. So that bravado was given to us because the school where we went to, there was hazing. It was as if we were in an English public school where you are harassed. The first years were harassed. So after you pass the first year, they know you're going to make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was in a school that produced writers where people had written before. Mm -hmm. So after publishing uh, that pamphlet in Nigeria in 1952, I thought everything else was going to work. You're right. Yeah. And You're then right. another colleague who was uh, called uh, J.P. Uchiti also wrote his first uh, novel as a student in Sassaman Baker School when we went to secondary school. So uh, in northern Uganda, or in the whole of Uganda, mm -hmm. uh, Gula School has produced a lot of uh, writers. A lot of writers. So uh, from uh, Budo, and then you went, how from did you? From Gula High School. From Gula, we went yes. to Sassaman Baker School. Uh -huh. And then after that, I went uh, to Kambogo to do a teacher training course. Mm -hmm. Okot also had been to a teacher training course. Yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, but when he was in that training school, he uh, either there or in King's College Budo, there was an American teacher of literature who introduced him to Song of Hiawatha. Uh, the one by Henry uh, Longfellow. Oh, Longfellow. After he had done it, they say it was a female teacher. Mm -hmm. And that the female teacher took him to her home to teach her uh, to read this book. And so God looked at himself also like he was the prince. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so on and so forth. So that is what, what happened. So Okot's education in literature mm -hmm. was in drinking the milk of literature from the teacher of song of Hiawatha yes, in but, King's College Budo. You are right. Uh, he sure. never went to university to study literature, no. but he learned literature from to love literature from the love of this book about a red Indian prince, Hiawatha. Hiawatha. Yes. Actually, Longfellow, sir. Um, I think mm -hmm. when I leave the studio, I have to go back and read because I have a collection of poems by okay. uh, Henry yeah. by Longfellow and that song of Hiawatha. Yeah. It's a very enchanting uh, piece of poetry yeah. there. Now, uh, Prof, and then, of course, from there, um, yeah. how did you uh, Well, get then, uh, when I went to Sesame Baker School, this was a new school, and we did Cambridge School Certificate the third year. And, uh, of course, as was expected, mm -hmm. or as was not expected, I set a new standard in the end of the year exams for school certificate English literature <laughs> and language. Yeah, right. uh, so the headmaster called me and congratulated me on it, said that the other two classes before me had not done as well as they did when I led the school in the school certificate. Mm -hmm. Then I knew that uh, as far as knowledge of literature is concerned, I was now up to grade. So when I went to Sir Samuel Baker, when I, after Sir Samuel Baker, went to Kambogo, then that was the time of my own intellectual awakening. We read every book that was there mm -hmm. in Kambogo. Mm -hmm. We had done it also in Sesame Elbaha School, where I was also a school librarian, and therefore I was a bookworm in that sense, because I would spend most of my time in the library, in the library right. and touching this book and that book and that other book. And in Sesame Elbaha School, mm -hmm. I became mm -hmm. taban. Pagan, <laughs> because I outgrew my 
Christianity. <laughs> uh, later on, I changed it from Taban Pagan to Taban uh, Lo Liyong uh-huh. because my mother is called Liyong and Taban is a Juba Arabic which means difficulties, uh-huh. hardships. Hardships. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, the hardships which the mothers experience when you were, when they were pregnant with you. So when they get it out of there, you say, I am tired, I'm exhausted, now at least I've got rid of you, get going. So my mother used to tell me, don't look back, we are not going to bury you in a casket, we are just going to bundle you up in, a, in leather and throw you in the, to the grave and that's going to be the end of it. So don't fear anything. We are not going to bury you in the casket because she was a policeman's wife and she had seen Europeans who were very, very special people being put in boxes and then being buried. She didn't know what was the matter as far as she was concerned. Was it because they were very, very important that they needed to be put in a box? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I therefore did not care what I did and how I'm going to die. You're right. Prof, very briefly now, after that uh, teacher's training college, then you went to the university. Yeah, I went to the University of Iowa. Howard? First first, First. first Howard University. Yes, yes. Yes, I went there, Mm -hmm. and my first publication was a short story Mm -hmm. in a literary magazine of the literature department, of the English department. Oh, great. Yes. If you are just joining us, this is the Books Cafe on KBC English Service, Mm -hmm. and the Books Cafe, your literature program. Mm -hmm. And today, in the studio, we have some very, very special guests. With me is the famous uh, professor of literature and writer, Professor Taban Loliong from South Sudan. Maybe I could, this is at the time that I would actually just want to mention a few of his titles that I've come across. The Last Word, The Second Last Word, Eating Chiefs, Another Nigger Dead, a Culture is Rutan, Meditations of Taban, Words That Melt a Mountain, Show What and So What a Play. A prof actually tells me that there was another play that actually uh, disapp- uh, uh, got lost. This one is called Cops. Cops Lovers and Cops Haters. Cops Lovers and, and Cops Haters. This is a, a collection of poetry. Mm. And then we have Fictions, mm. a short story collection. And then we have, uh, this one is, uh, uh, prof, this one is uh, when? What does it look like? Oh, yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, oh, is uh, my handwriting. Yeah. Yes, but, uh, but there are but the titles of Professor Taban Lo Leong's uh, mm. books, Meditation mm. of Taban Lo Leong. Mm. And then we have Professor Chris Wangela also uh, joining us in the studio, the famous professor of literature. Of course, uh, many of you would have read his books, uh, Faces at Crossroads, Standpoints on East African Literature, Singing with the Night, The Debtors, The Seasons of Harvest, The Seasons of Harvest, Attachment to the Sun for Home and Freedom, yes. And then, of course, his uh, forthcoming autobiography. Of course, some of these books actually uh, Prof edited them. His books of literary criticism and those ones that he edited. Now, uh, Professor Chris Rangela, you know, uh, literary criticism, back in the 1970s, you know, when you went to the university, uh, of course, you've just underlined how you became interested. Of course, first of all, uh, meeting Professor Taban Lo Leong as an undergraduate, and then, of course, a prof asking you to write something on Ezekiel Mpakalele's writing. That was your first interest. And then, of course, the actual becoming a literary critic was when your teachers, Andrew Gar and, and Adrian Rusko at the University of Nairobi, asked you to do some critical works on the poetry of Joseph Buruga, The Abandoned Heart, and uh, John Beatty's... Poems of Nature poems and of, Faith, yes. Yes, and then you became a critic. When you look at, you know, literary criticism, a prof, you know, you strike me as one of those very few Kenyan scholars that I know, or Africans who are in the Republic of Letters, that it were, who actually took that path of literary criticism. Most of your contemporaries, and even those ones who came before you, after going through the departments of literature, they became writers. They were more interested in creative writing, but you, literary criticism. If you could, what makes a good literature critic? Now, what happened is, when I joined the uh, English department as a student Mm -hmm. in September 1968, Mm -hmm. the department was manned largely by foreigners, Mm -hmm. uh, expatriates. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, the the head of the department was then uh, uh, Dr. James 
Stewart, who was a South African uh, white man. And uh, along also came people like Angus Kulda, Adrian Roscoe. And uh, when I joined the department, mm. the Africans who were there were Ngugiwa Diongo and uh, Professor Tabando Leong. So the interesting thing is that uh, we were sort of torn between two lovely hands, as it were. Because the, you know, the coterie of uh, literary scholars who came from outside were actually there to propagate the British literature, what we call English literature. And in a way, uh, they were trying to resist changes that were being uh, introduced by the African scholars on staff. Already, Tabando Leong, uh, Henry Owa Nyumba, and Ngugi had come up with a paper on the abolition of the Department of English. Mm. This had uh, been circulated even in the Faculty of Arts with the help of uh, Professor B.A. Ogot, who was then the dean of the faculty. So that was a time that uh, even historians were asking questions like, what is African history? So African scholars on staff began asking questions about the wisdom of putting foreign literature at the center of uh, literary studies in an African university. So when I joined, it was English department. But around 1970, that battle was being won. Uh, it was not only in the Department of Literature, but it was also even in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, people like uh, Phil Pocheng uh, were joining you know, the debate. And for the first time, the Department of English at the University of Nairobi began the flag, you know, became the flag bearer for changes in the study of literature, where mm -hmm. the debate was that we start with the non and spread out to the unknown. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare should not be at the center of our studies, neither should the Chaucer and others. We should start with the Nishimu oral literature, Achede, oral literature oral, yes. uh, written East African literature, then African literature, then literature of the African experience, and then literature of the uh, black world, and then only come to Shakespeare as part of literature of the rest of the world. This was really the talk of the department when I joined. But, you know, as an undergraduate, it was very difficult to know <laughs> uh, squarely what was happening. Mm -hmm. But then when we moved into uh, second, uh, second year as students, Taban Loliong and uh, Edwin Roscoe began teaching African literature. For the first time, uh, Taban taught the oral literature of Africa. And uh, we were surprised to come across a very wide reading list because we, we were being told that there was nothing, <laughs> there was no uh, African, there was no oral literature. But he came up with a, you know, so we were the first people to do uh, a paper, oral literature. I remember colleagues in my group actually doing papers, which some of them were published mm -hmm. in a book which was later edited by Taban Lulong called Popular Culture in East Africa. And some of those essays are in standpoints on African literature. So that is when it became uh, incumbent on me that, uh, in fact, we belonged to a versatile literature. And then uh, he was teaching uh, the African novel. Roscoe had just done his PhD on Nigerian literature, so which became uh, published later as uh, uh, Mother is Gold, where he's talking about uh, a Nigerian literature and so on. And then uh, somehow James Stewart, who was a bit reluctant in changing, was always talking about African literature in the European context. Mm -hmm. So that every time he talked about uh, Gabriel Okara, you have to co compare him with Dylan Thomas, or some European mm -hmm. uh, poet. You know, it, African literature was always to be an appendage <laughs> of, uh, mm -hmm. if you are talking about Achebe, you must talk of Thomas Hardy. If you are talking about Ngugi, you must always talk about D.H. Lawrence or uh, Joseph Conrad, that kind of thinking. But slowly, we wind ourselves from that kind mm -hmm. of tradition. Mm -hmm. So I joined the debate so that when I did my uh, postgraduate studies, I focused on East African literature. And uh, one of my celebrated essays <laughs> was on Taban Leong's uh, uh, works, and I invented a term called the Tabanic genre, <laughs> mm -hmm. which uh, uh, has been uh, referred to by many critics. And, uh, you know, I studied uh, for the first time, I talked about uh, Charles Mangwa. There was always a debate between uh, Taban Leong and James Stewart about uh, works like uh, uh, Son of Woman, at Goth Institute. And uh, of course, uh, for these foreigners, uh, Charles Mango was uh, 
indulging in pornography and so on. But our wrong voices led by Taban showed that these are voices that are breaking a new ground where as writers they are now beginning to explore mm -hmm. our own experience. Mm -hmm. So I joined the fray and when I wrote my uh, thesis I included uh, writers like David Mailu who would never be uh, mentioned in uh, uh, honorable circles in uh, <laughs> seminar yes, rooms. Yes, yes. So what looked uh, cheap and uh, dangerous literature became the talk of the time. And then, uh, of course, from West Africa, we had people like Uli Bayer writing about uh, Onisha market literature, airport literature, airport art, and so on. I, I realized that, in fact, Kenya was benefiting from the presence of people like uh, Zakir Mpakhlele, uh, Tabano Leong, and so on, so that Kenyans were also beginning to pick their own voices through the presence of these uh, versatile Africans from our neighboring countries, mm -hmm. which uh, was very, which was a plus for the growth of literature in this country. You are right, Professor Chris Wanjala. They are actually uh, trying to actually take us back uh, through the history, you know, the challenges that were there. That when he joined the University of Nairobi, it was he was actually admitted into the Department of English, but then. African uh, scholars like Professor Tab and Loli Young there were questioning that why should, you know, a department in an African university a privilege a European literature and make African uh, literature or writings to be subservient? Of course, they won that battle. Professor Tab and Loli Young, you know, I've had quite, just like I was mentioning earlier, that I've had quite some sessions with Professor Chris Wangela, always uh, there, invaluable to share you know, his knowledge and, you know, experiences. He is actually our link with your generation. The role of the creative writer in East Africa in the 19... Because apparently, from what I learned from Professor Chris Wangela is that you, s you are not just a creative writer. You actually uh, traverse the two worlds of literature that you, you very comfortably fit in as a critic and as a creative writer. So let's talk about the role of the creative writer. I think um, uh, there are, uh, uh, you are some of your essays published back in the 1970s when you articulated uh, these issues. Well, as I told you, when I went to school, mm -hmm. uh, we used to have the Friday afternoon uh, short uh, folktale, mm -hmm. uh, which threw me into realizing mm -hmm. uh, that... Uh, the folk tales were not kid stuff. Sometimes a folk tale was fox tale cast into fiction using animals rather than human beings. If the chief has two or three wives and one of them is a thief, you don't go to tell it in front of the chief that your wife steals. You can create a story about the elephant and this and that and so on and so forth. Uh, so sometimes later on in the evening, uh, when people are telling folk tales, then the real stories are told about the behaviors or misbehaviors of the people. So all the time, fiction or oral literature was told in the context of the culture of the people who created those folk tales. Now, when we came to studying of literature, we also realized that the English language was being sold to us in order to spread. Uh, literature was being taught to us to understand English culture. And the Germans were also teaching themselves German literature, where that is where Goethe becomes a very, very important link. And every nation had a literature so that the utm utmost quality of a um, people's culture was written in the works of their best writers and in their language. Now, when we were colonial subjects, 
our culture was supposed to be a link between us and the mother language. That is uh, why at one time when we, after Uganda was getting independence, some of the teachers, some of the uh, ministers, when they came back from England, they said, when I came back from home, in this very university, Nairobi University, the first professors, including Alan Ogot and Ominde, used to go for holidays into England and their ba and the family. Alan Ogot, uh, Wasao, Minde, and others. The first professors here, together with the white, always had England as their home. When I came here in 1968, uh, they were still doing so. They later on cut it out. But <laughs> the question was, in what context then would you study the literature of Africa, of a, an African colonial country with so many languages? What nation do you call it? Whose tribe then do you decide uh, to make it the national tribe of the country? Uh, so we, we are stuck there. Mm -hmm. So uh, later on, it became that, okay, let us study English. But uh, let us also spread knowledge of folk tales, traditional literature of Africa in the various languages of the nation. Mm -hmm. So when you get Chisaina and uh, Grace Ogot and other people uh, writing in their own vernaculars, when you uh, get uh, Shaban Robert writing in Kiswahili, and when you got right way Palawino uh, in Acholi, of course, uh, the Acholi are not the masters of Uganda, mm -hmm. and they've never been. So you can't adopt uh, Acholi as uh, the language of Uganda, but you can adopt an, Af uh, an Acholi tale told in English. Yeah, right. So, as far as language is concerned, we agree that for better or for worse, let us use English language to uh, carry forward you know, the prof, African reality. You, are, you know, Prof, you know, um, I would actually want us to stick on that because, you know, mm. you are your colleague mm. and contemporary at the University of Nairobi in those days, Professor Ngugi mm. has has always been very critical mm. with that position. Mm -hmm. And I know it's the same position that is actually shared by uh, Chinua Achebe. Mm. There are two interesting essays that Chinua Achebe mm. actually wrote. Mm -hmm. And many people either they, 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 they pretend that they have never come across these essays mm. or they don't just want where he actually takes on that position that you are saying about the role of, Eng of English mm -hmm. even in a contemporary African environment. Mm -hmm. The first essay is actually called Language and the Destiny of Man. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is the politics of language mm -hmm. and the politicians mm -hmm. of language. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And he, he takes on that, uh, on actually what you've just stated. Mm -hmm. What do you, I want you to actually talk to your mm. to your uh, to your colleague and friend yeah yes no I, as far as i see it mm. that was why i was very very critical at one time mm. about uh africans especially those from the major tribes uh writing things in the vernacular because it will look as if they are whispering into the ears of the blessed or of the chosen uh, or if they write first in the vernacular, then are they not favoring a certain uh, group? Although in the process, again, you will want every uh, tribe or every group to promote their own culture and their own language, keep it alive. But then the question is, is it the language or is it the knowledge you are sharing? Are you caring about the whole nation or are you favoring a certain uh, language? Uh, there are certain things we in South Sudan may have to write in Kinubi, what they call Kinubi, or Juba, Arabic, rather than uh, Kuku, Dinka, or Nwer, or Shiluk, or uh, Azande, so that everybody who doesn't care where you come from will read it in Juba Arabic, in a lingua franca. 
now in Kenya here, you do have Swahili. Swahili is for everybody. Mm -hmm. It is the language of the nation, it is in the parliament, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So everybody should uh, write for the nation in Swahili so that the language, the philosophy in the language, in Swahili language itself, mm -hmm. gets embedded into the minds of all the Kenyans so that Swahili carries forward the knowledge from all the other tribes mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. Because language itself uh, is a cheat. It carries a lot of things mm -hmm. more than just the word. You are right. Yeah. Now, uh, Prof, I actually want you uh, both to address this question. That you, uh, uh, Professor Taban Loliong, you did mention in one of our earlier discussions um, on, on the few occasions that I've, I've met you and it's actually you've been very consistent on this that at during pre or even during the struggle mm. for independence you know there were, mm. we had you know politicians mm. and artists mm. or writers and you yeah. call the politicians or the freedom fighters you actually call them the dramatists okay and All then right. you, and then you and then you talk of the writers and then you say that the writers were supposed uh, to follow what okay. the politicians take over from a, a position that i don't uh, because I would, uh, are you suggesting that mm. literature is subservient to politics no, no. Uh, what i'm trying to say yes is that uh, prof and then you'll actually yeah, comment on the same that uh, first and foremost uh, a writer is not only a writer a writer is a dealer in ideas at encased, as encased in a language. So the writer is an artist with words. And he does not only use words, but he understands the meaning of words, the complexities of words and sentences and ideas and ideology. Uh, so uh, when we had people who understood what colonialism was, what being colonized was. If somebody could explain to us, uh, could not only explain to us, but reveal to an audience in clear terms what is wrong with the, uh, colonialism, then uh, it means he is an artist with the words. Now, there are two types of artist. There is the artist, there is the man who understands that thing and can call can sway an audience to go and take action and is ready to carry the flag and go and uh, storm the Bastille. That is the artist, dramatist, who is a politician. Yes. All of them, whether it is Nyerere, whether it is Nkrumah, whether it is Kenyatta, whether it is Lenin, whether uh, it is Che, or uh, whether it is Castro, and whether it is uh, Mugabe or Nelson Mandela, they are artists with the words, but also artists with the courage to go and storm the Bastille. Mm -hmm. The other the, group? The other group is the one which explains the one which plays a uh, second fiddle. They only want to limit themselves to expressing these things in words much more clearly, uh, as the French say, le mot juste, using the most important word to pinpoint the idea. And that is why they can even write in complicated way. They can by bite you in the language when you are listening and you will not understand what is being used because they are using uh, 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 idioms. So as far as they are concerned, they are content to tell you the story <laughs> and leave it to those people to do. So when independence came, we became the explainers of what uh, ideology was and what the politicians, dramatists were doing. And then, of course, after independence, they t told us, now you can leave us. <laughs> <laughs> I think I want, I want to agree with the, uh, Professor Tabando Leong here yes. and uh, expand the notion of an artist or a creative person. And I want to also invoke uh, Professor Okelo Chulu's essay once in the uh, East Africa Journal, where he was talking about uh, uh, a creative imagination, where he went to uh, great lengths to show that uh, not only creative writers are creative, but somebody, an engineer who creates, who causes 
uh, a bridge to be built uh, so that people may cross a river is a creative person. A, a Nyerere, a politician who arouses the emotions of uh, uh, his audience to action, is an artist. Uh, but what is now, of course, coming to be is that uh, there is a way in which uh, one type of artist could uh, uh, subdue his own role and slavishly follow uh, the politician so that he just becomes a, a kind of his master's voice uh, without creativity, just repeating what uh, the politicians are doing. And that's why I celebrate uh, Wole Shoinka. Shoinka has uh, refused to, uh, to play the role of uh, uh, the voice for the politician. He himself has really taken the bull by the horn and uh, he's dealing with the contemporary issues in the best possible language, using all forms of uh, uh, creativity, the novel, the essay, uh, and drama. And that's why I think uh, uh, Shoinka gets in trouble with uh, some regimes and so on. So the moment uh, the writer subordinates his talent to the politicians, as it has been where uh, people become slavishly sort of uh, uh, worshipping the heroes of Uru, as uh, Masrui would call them, uh, then, of course, they are also abdicating their own responsibility. Mm -hmm. And this is where, in fact, I want to agree with Taban in the 1970s when he said, uh, uh, soon we are going to find those writers who are slavishly hooked to history, they are going to run out of their steam. And uh, after that, after that preoccupation with history, so what? And now that's why we are... Uh, uh, writers uh, are eschewing, uh, move, you know, uh, uh, realism in literature, and uh, coming up with a, a more creative kind of approach. And this is uh, coming especially from South Africa, with writers like uh, James Courtesy, Christopher Hope, and and others. Uh, unless the writers make a real leap, uh, they will be running out of steam, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why a younger generation of readers are finding writers like Chino Achebe, uh, Ngugi, uh, and others rather obsolete and irrelevant, <laughs> uh, uh, out of fashion. They are now going in for more spontaneous, more contemporary, more existentialist writers. Thank you so much, the two distinguished African uh, professors. Professor Taban Lodion, mm. thank you so much for visiting us. We want the old days to come back. Mm -hmm. The old days of talking, chatting, critiquing about literature, mm -hmm. of crossing swords. <laughs> Not because you are fighting, <laughs> but because yes. your point of view is different. Uh, Prof, 15 seconds. <laughs> I really uh, congratulate KBC for having Hainga, uh, who is now a literary diplomat, bring us this uh, program. Because it will bring all ranges of writers to this program. With him, we have a lot of hope. <laughs> Thank you, Prof, of course. With my producer there, Jared Ombui. And until next time, it's goodbye for now.